Today I'm joined by Michael Litt, CEO of Vidyard. Michael, welcome. Thanks for having me, Scott. Glad to be here. Well, I want to start off with a fun story, a personal story, is that when you first started, and I think there were just three of you guys, then you ended up marrying your first customer. Can you tell us about that story? <laughs> yes, yeah, it's a, it's a great story indeed. So when we were at Y Combinator, there's a, a simple model and approach to the way that they, they help startups think about the problem they're solving. And that is to build something people want. And they, they actually give you a shirt that says build something people want on it. And it's, it's the motto. And I think that's part of the reason why Y Combinator is successful. And so when we launched our product, we had a few customers, but one really cared about what we were doing more than anybody else. And her name was Donna. And so um, Donna would call the 1-800 number anytime she had a problem with the software. And again, we're building something people want. And so at that time, when you call the 1-800 number and press one for sales uh, or two for customer support or three for general inquiries, they all came to my cell phone. And, and she just assumed, you know, we're a much larger company and had this automatic routing system based on, on her contact. And so she would tell us and tell me all the issues she had with the software. I'd create a list. We'd put it on the wall and we'd go and solve those problems for Donna. And then I'd call her back and we'd solve the problems. And so we built this really interesting um, kind of vendor relationship over the span of about three months and working towards helping her achieve her goals helped us achieve goals for many other customers and laid the foundation for a software to date. So when I moved back to Waterloo from Y Combinator and I met her in person, I realized I would uh, really much enjoy to spend more time with her. And so uh, we ended up uh, getting together and then getting married. And uh, the joke around the office is we take customer success very seriously, but of course, marrying your customers doesn't, doesn't scale very well. Right, right, right. Now, so the question is, did, did she end up getting favorable terms and discounts? <laughs> no, actually, actually <laughs> she does not. So fast forward to today, um, the, the company that she was a part of was called Tribe HR, sold to NetSuite. She then led HCM product at uh, NetSuite before that acquisition to Oracle and has now started up a, a new business called Kite. And uh, they are a customer all over again. She's a power user and she still has lots of feedback on the product, which is great. Well, I think that's a terrific story. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, I appreciate it. Now mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit about Y Combinator. And I believe you guys are one of the highest valued uh, alum, alumni of uh, Y Combinator. What was your experience there? And in, in, if you were to look at it objectively, do you feel that you would achieve the current success that you, you have realized today even without Y Combinator, or was Y Combinator material to your success? Yeah, it's a great question. YC is incredible at disassociating the noise of starting a company from what's truly important. And what I mean by that is when you start a business, there's all sorts of busy work. There's uh, contract-based agreements, there's leases, there, there are things that you need, fundamentals to build a business, but have nothing to do with actually solving a problem for a customer. And back to this concept of building something people want. And the partners are very, very good at ensuring that the organizations in the program are focused on solving that problem and growing a core metric. And so I remember the very first meeting I had with Paul Graham uh, was a walk around Pioneer Way in Mountain View. And it's a 20 minute meeting, it's not very long. And it's designed to extract as much value as possible so that he can impact as many startups as possible in the day. And the very first thing he said was, is your product in market? And we said, yes. And he said, are you billing customers for it? And we said, yes. He said, okay, take your, your MRR number and focus on growing it by 10% per week. And every conversation we had subsequently was, are you growing that number by 10% per week? And if not, why not? And the why not is where all the meat of the problem is. And so... YC is so good at, at just focusing you on what matters most. The other benefit of YC for us was that, you know, we're Canadians that had relocated to Silicon Valley and we had no distractions whatsoever around us while we started the company. There was no birthday parties or events or weddings. We, we had a license to be as selfish as possible about starting this business. And the way we put that into play was I was doing business development from basically 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And the team was doing product development from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. As so we were running a 24-hour shift. And so I would do outbound prospecting and talking to customers and create a list of feedback from people like Donna, who I eventually married, and then giving that to the dev team to build while I slept. 
so I could wake up the next day and go back to those customers and tell them that we'd solve the problem. And, you know, YC pushed us so hard to do that on the basis that the end of the program is demo day in which you get to stand in front of, you know, four to 500 of the most, of the most prolific angel investors in Silicon Valley and tell them your story and potentially raise money that there's this, there's this sense of urgency that's created. So it's a phenomenal program. And if I was to start a company again, despite having gone through it, I would apply to YC. That is a great story. And thank you so much for deconstructing it. I think uh, one of the things that uh, not enough accelerators and programs really emphasize is this notion of market fit. Uh, yes. If you think about really great successful businesses, it's because they solved a, a real need. And sometimes that uh, market fit doesn't happen until ma many years later. And I think about Amazon AWS as an example where when Amazon launched it, it just didn't seem like there was market fit, but they were patient and they saw the trend and where things were going. And eventually, of course, things just took off. Great yeah. story. Let's talk about your company, Vidyar. Yeah. Uh, it was originally started as a production company, but th the company that eventually became the startup was spun off. Uh, now, the, it's a video platform that hosts and shares and tracks videos. It's, it helps to create videos easily and also allows for video personalization for viewers. Now, this space is fairly crowded. So how do you guys stand out and why do your customers love you guys? Yeah, for sure. So really quick on the backstory there, we knew that there was a gap in how companies were using video. And so we solved that gap by helping them produce the video. And in that process, we understood the gaps of simply putting that video on their website. And the reality is, is, is the status quo solution to do that is, is YouTube. The problem with YouTube is that it's an ad-based platform. Um, if your competitors are smart and you're using a YouTube embed on your homepage, you know, they can advertise on your homepage. And YouTube's model is designed to take you to YouTube.com where you know, YouTube is, is, is built around cascading your, your time with more and more content, right? And so if you watch a product video on an on a, on a interesting website or a vendor that you're interested in, you click the YouTube video, you're on YouTube.com, six hours past, you're watching videos of dog running skateboards. And so the simple problem that we solved initially was how do we create a branded solution that helps people easily put video on their website? And the goal was always to be the fastest way to do that from upload to embed and, and do that in a way that lets them control the experience for the viewer. And so that's how we stood out very, very simply. Then we realized we could actually track how people were consuming the content. We could anonymize that data and give it to the business en masse, but we could also use the video itself as a way of capturing a lead or leads information. And so after the video or before the video, we could embed a form. And that form could be a, a Marketo form, a Pardot form, an Eloqua form, a HubSpot form, you name it. And that led us to the realization that we could actually track how individuals were consuming video and we could push that data into the customer's CRM or their marketing automation system. And so we started getting into this really robust and sophisticated set of functionality that enterprises were craving, which was who's watching video for how long are they becoming a buyer? How do we justify the ROI of video against these views, which then led into all sorts of other functionality in terms of, uh, personalization of video on mass, the, the creation tools, the Chrome extension, uh, integrating those creation tools into other workflows and so on and so forth. So it's a very traditional story of solving a really simple, straightforward problem and adding functional complexity based on our customers' needs uh, to essentially create what we, what we are today. And, and today what we are is a video platform for business. And so if you're using video for marketing, we have a set of solutions for you. If you're using it for sales prospecting, if you're using it for later stage sales funnel development, supporting customers, internal secure communications, live streaming town halls in a secure fashion so that information doesn't leak, that's where we have uh, solution sets. And so we tend to be very successful, not only in small businesses, but, but primarily in, in the mid-market and enterprise as well. Yeah, I think that really starts to kind of explain why you guys have changed or challenged the freemium SaaS model. Um, yes. Most, of course, starts with a free, free version and then move up to professional and enterprise. You guys have actually focused on the enterprise, the mid-market and so forth, because really, aside from the actual hosting creation, it's the analytics, it's the insight, it's the action-oriented uh, data that then helps them to inform 
not just their ROI, but how to actually build this content to monetize it. So I think that's really uh, very exciting. Uh, tell me how your model of approaching enterprise first worked out. Yeah. So, you know, in the very beginning of time for us, when we built the hosting platform, you know, it was a very simple, you know, $20 per month subscription fee. And we just did not have the distribution or the eyeballs or the SEO to really drive that kind of model successfully. And as we got into kind of more complex customer arrangements and building these integrations and providing really good data, we knew we were a valuable solution that could charge more. And then we got into security, uh, which is a, it's a massive challenge for large enterprises. And so we started kind of with a freemium small business model and we moved up market into, into the enterprise space. And um, that's where we found success. That's where we kind of found breakaway growth and, uh, and what we would call escape velocity in, in the startup ecosystem. That said, the, the buying process for software has changed. And I was with Brian Halligan from HubSpot uh, during the inbound conference. And, and we were having a, a fairly intimate discussion with a number of executives. And he asked the table and said, I asked the table a very simple question. How many of you have made a software buying decision in the past year? And nobody's hand went up. And then the, the, the extra question or the extended question to that was, how many of you made a software buying decision in the five years prior? And everybody's hands went up. And so the discussion became around what has changed. And what has changed is that in the MarTech landscape where we exist, in 2011, there was 100, 100 150 businesses. Now there's over 7,000. And every one of those businesses is calling the CMO saying, we're going to accelerate deal flow. We're going to help you create more pipeline. We're going to help your team save time building email campaigns and nurtures and all these types of things. And it's all the same message. The interesting shift is that the buying power has actually gone to the people that are doing the work. And if they need to solve a problem like putting a video on a landing page, they're going to go and use a free solution because they don't want to go through the overhead and the complexity of creating a sales order and getting procurement involved and running an RFP because they need to solve the problem today and right now, not in six or eight weeks based on most enterprise purchasing cycles. And so we realized there was an opportunity given that our technology was designed to be the fastest way to upload and embed a video on a website to offer that basic functionality for free with a clear upgrade path as the needs of the organization got more complex. And so we could offer a free solution without putting our enterprise or mid-market or small business um, operation at risk just by adhering ourselves to the new purchasing process of the way companies work. And again, what happens is someone in the business is going to start using the software, getting value out of it, telling someone else in the business who's going to start using it, getting value out of it. And then eventually they'll go to the CMO or the VP sales or the CIO and the lead decision maker and say, look, we're getting success out of this thing. We need to buy it so that we can get these extra features versus us going in and saying, hey, you should buy this because this is the value we'll produce. This is conversely, here's the value we've gotten. Now we want to buy the software. And so just like in consumer land, the consumer has all the power and the next generation of buyers, the Gen Z, the alpha generation, they expect this type of behavior because this is what they're used to in consumer world. And that's the, the, the tailwind we see both in the adoption of video, but also in the adoption of, of what we call the freemium buying cycle. So it's a very exciting time and it's been a very successful launch. Yeah, I really like the way you describe the SaaS um, subscription model where it's user or consumer driven because they're the ones that's actually creating the content and having to manage it. So yes. they feel the greatest set of friction. Uh, and so if you can solve their problem, then it allows for them to be able to quickly um, address it. Now, analogy I think about is, um, you know, when the Apple uh, phone came out, iPhone came out, most enterprises actually didn't want to deal with it because of the host of security issues. But it was the individuals that were bringing their own personal iPhones into the uh, enterprise IT environment. And then over time, it just kind of got this critical mass where they had no choice but to actually start to react and start to build infrastructure and security around it. So in a way, I think that critical mass that comes from the, the actual employees or the contributors that's doing it. And of course, once your video is there, uh, you need to actually do personalization. They need to, you need to actually have analytics. So it just makes a, a very logical uh, upward progression in terms of why they want to 
um, increase their premium subscription models. That's a perfect analogy. And, and for what it's worth, I was at BlackBerry in 2007 and 2008 when the iPhone launched in a software product management role. And I got to see the bring your own device trend happen in real time and disrupt what was a very proven top-down business model, as we all know. Yep, absolutely. Uh, I was just going to share a quick story because I just feel that uh, because you mentioned millennials and Gen Zs and the importance of the rise of videos, and I was interviewing uh, Travis Chambers, who's a founder of Chamber Media. And what Chamber Media does is it's a combination of, of uh, Super Bowl commercials with kind of a uh, modern day millennial friendly info commercial. And, it, and they create these anchor videos where literally the sales methodology is built into the video, but because it's like a Super Bowl, humorous, fun, engaging video, the metrics are off the charts. Yeah. And then more importantly, to your point around analytics, they then create sub videos depending on what happens. There's maybe somebody who came back to it or there's a recall or maybe there's somebody who has questions or a certain sales obstacles. So there's a video for that. And what they've seen is they literally um, have seen one of their uh, clients go from $10 million to $50 million in just one year of implementing these series of videos and analytics. And it just shows the power of videos uh, in current times. Yep, you're absolutely right. Now let's quickly talk about uh, Garage Capital, which you are a general right. partner. Um, my understanding it was funded by Venture Capital Catalyst Initiative. It was part of a $50 million grant. How does it work? And then more specifically, what do you guys invest in? Yeah, it's a great question. So when we came back from Y Combinator to Canada um, to start operating Vidyard, we were one of the first companies to do so uh, that didn't stay in Silicon Valley. And the reason we chose to, to come back was specifically for the access to high quality developer talent. And the reality is, you know, video platform, the, the architecture involved, trying to uh, ensuring that you create a reliable uh, streaming service is not a, a trivial task and so we needed some really high quality engineers that's why we chose to to come back to our alma mater and dev and i are both grads from the university of waterloo which is a very well-known engineering and cs school here in canada and since we came back more companies started doing the same started bucking the trend and and you know yc now has a very distributed um set of alumni all over the world because innovation doesn't necessarily just happen in, in silicon valley the one challenge we saw in the ecosystem, which is kind of Waterloo Toronto corridor, is that there wasn't seed investors that understood this new world of, of seed investing, investing on safes and notes and, and very frictionless mechanisms to help companies raise the money that they need and then go and, and deploy it uh, relatively effectively and quickly. And we realized that we had a kind of an unfair advantage in deal flow with respect to companies that were leaving Canada and going to YC for starters. And so the three, my, myself, Devin, my co-founder, Vidyard, who's our, our CTO, and a really good friend of mine from high school who also went to Y Combinator and sold his company to Google, his company is called Bufferbox, his name is Mike McCauley, decided to pool our resources together to invest in a few of these companies. And six investments later, one of our investors in Vidyard said, hey, you know, you guys are generating some really interesting deal flow. And we've done Series A or subsequent investments in a few of your deals. Would you be interested in taking some capital from us and using our back office to go invest in, and continue to, to build this ecosystem of great companies and to help them scale their sales teams and technology teams, et cetera? So we, we quickly went from six investments, which is what we call Fund One, uh, to an $8 million fund, Fund Two, um, that did about um, 40 to 50 checks in companies ranging from 50 to hundred thousand dollars and through that process we got access to some amazing entrepreneurs who raised some incredible follow-on uh, financing um, very active portfolio uh, we got to learn a lot from the entrepreneurs we we're investing in and we got to teach them what we had learned and and we started to see this ecosystem start to generate and grow in in southwestern ontario um, we closed fund two and have now in the process of, of closing fund three which is a 30 million dollar investment vehicle um, with the same same thesis and mentality as the first two. So really smart founders focused on B2B SaaS and businesses that could impact a billion people's lives. Um, you know, folks that are going to YC or, or generated from this, this syndicate, um, the first check 
we write is $250,000, um, and we reserve the right to a follow-on check of up to a million dollars um, as the company finds kind of breakaway growth and traction. And um, again, it's just a really interesting way of, of enabling the ecosystem, of learning from these entrepreneurs because business models change. And, and you know, we went from enterprise to freemium on the basis of seeing the way the buying process was changing. A lot of that was advised from these entrepreneurs that we're working with. And so it's been a phenomenal learning experience and uh, something that I can see myself doing for the next 150 years. I think uh, it really serves as a great use case for cities as well as economic regions that are looking to develop and create that ecosystem and to support it and capitalize it. So I hope that other, not just Canadian uh, cities and regions, but also other parts of the world consider uh, your early successes as an indicator and a, and a, and a general framework for them to consider in, into their uh, ecosystem build out. My last yeah. question is, and this is central to our podcast is, what was your greatest product innovation failure and the lessons learned? And I believe you covered some of this in your TED talk. Yes, yes I did. Um, so there's, I mean, failure is, is a really interesting topic, right? Because um, I think failure is really the successful observation of something that did not work. Right. And so the word failure is, is in some ways a misnomer and it has a lot of negative connotation to it. And, you know, we have a fail fast culture here at Vidyard. Um, the failure you're referring to is my brother and I tried to start a biodiesel refinery and, you know, we were, we were ill-equipped from a skill set expertise. It was built on a government grant program that, that ended in an election cycle as these things often do. Um, at Vidyard, you know, there have been countless product innovations that have failed. A really good example of this is our, our Chrome extension is a, is a wonderful utility um, that helps people easily create video, either via a webcam recording or a screen recording. And that video is used in, in, in support cases, internal communications, um, marketing teams produce it and send it out via email campaigns. Across all the integrated use cases, there's about 650,000 users globally of this product. It's growing very quickly. It's only been in market for about a year and a half. And the first version of that product was a complete failure. Uh, it was called Studio. And what Studio was, was a way that you could upload a PowerPoint and speak to the PowerPoint, which would then create a video and then, and then have that sent, which doesn't sound entirely different from what we inevitably produced. Um, but what we realized was the distribution mechanism, the process of creating a PowerPoint and uploading it and then speaking over it and creating a video asset that could be embedded in an email was very sticky and full of friction. But from that failed product launch, there was a few aspects of that product which worked, which were then iterated into a product we launched called Engage. And Engage was a little more successful but didn't quite nail distribution. And then we used that learning or that failure to build Viewed It, which was the first version of what we see today, which became Go Video, and now we just call Vidyard in its various forms. Um, I guess the point of the story here is we've had a successful product in market for a year and a half that we've innovated against. But prior to that product, there were three failed products that were various versions of what we eventually built and were successful with. And the most important thing about failure is that you can build a positive culture around it and that you treat it as something that you learn from. And what that's kind of evolved into today is when we ever, when we think about launching something new, we actually have a, a pre-mortem conversation about it. We try to identify, based on all of the experience we have as an organization, why we think it will fail. And that is kind of speaks to Charlie Munger's theory of inversion. Um, you know, thinking about the, the barriers and the failures before you think about the successes. And I think that's what failure can really teach you to do as an organization. I think that's a terrific advice on a final, final note. So today I've been joined by Michael Litt, CEO and co-founder of Vidyard. Michael, thanks for joining today. Thank you, Scott. It's been a pleasure.